Hello, everybody. I'm going to do a live stream for History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Margaret Barker. Welcome to the show. And today, we're going to be talking about her book, The Great Angel, A Study of Israel's Second God. This is the book right here. Um, I'll have a link to it in the description below, so you, the audience, can go purchase it. I highly recommend that you do. Margaret Barker has developed an approach to biblical studies now known as temple theology. Margaret Barker read theology at the University of Cambridge, England, and went on to pursue her research independently. She was elected president of the Society for Old Testament Study in 1998 and edited the Society's second monograph series published by Ashgate. She has so far written 17 books, uh, which form a sequence, later volumes building on her earlier conclusion. Since 1997, she has been part of the Symposium Religion, Science and the Environment, convened by His All Holiness Bartholomew I, the Ecumenical Patriarch. This work has led her to develop the practical implications of temple theology as the basis for a Christian environment theology. In July 2008, Margaret Barker was awarded a DD by the Archbishop Canterbury in recognition of her work on the Jerusalem Temple and the origins of Christian liturgy which has made a significantly new contribution to our understanding of the New Testament and opened up important fields for research. Uh, Margaret Barker is a mother and grandmother, retired Methodist preacher, and was involved for over 30 years with the work of a woman's refuge. Well, again, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Barker. Thank you. So let's get started with the questions. How did the Jews back then, the ancient Jews, view Yahweh? Um, and was he once understood as the son of El? And why did they later combine them together as the same God? Well, that's a whole basket of questions that could fill an hour. Um, <clears throat> we've got to be very, very careful when we start talking like this, that we use words very carefully. And the first word there that we've got to be careful about is the word Jew, because the Jews themselves did not use that name of themselves until after the exile in Babylon in the time of the Second Temple. Before that, they were all called Hebrews. And you find that the Jewish historian, for example, Josephus, is very careful to observe this distinction that before the exile uh, there were Judeans and the people of Israel and so forth but broadly they were Hebrews and so you are you have two questions how did the Hebrews view Yahweh the Lord when he was understood as the son of El Elyon God most high and the second one would be how did the Jews of the second temple period uh, regard that heritage of Yahweh as the son of God most high. So if I deal with the first of those questions first, <clears throat> the Hebrews had a rather more populated heaven than we sometimes imagine. Uh, it's very difficult to know exactly what their heaven was like and how they imagined it because so much of our source material has been transmitted by the scribes of the second temple post-exilic period and they as a matter of religious practice removed from the texts aspects that they thought were blasphemous they realized that their religious ideas had moved on. And so when they copied out the text, they didn't just copy them out. They copied them out and cleaned them up a bit because they felt that the older texts had got elements in them that they had outgrown. And so the idea of the Lord as being the son of God Most High is something that by the second temple, uh, most Jews felt they had outgrown, and so the texts were cleaned up. Um, now, this wasn't, I don't think this was active suppression or anything like that. It's just they felt they had moved on. 
So the Hebrews, the pre-exilic Hebrews, <clears throat> regarded the Lord as the firstborn of the 70 mighty angels who were the sons of El Elyon, God Most High. And he was the firstborn, <clears throat> and because he was the firstborn, he was allocated the people of <clears throat> Israel as his special heritage, if you like. So the firstborn was in effect, the guardian angel of Israel. And he had a lot of siblings who were the guardians of the other nations. Then when you get to the post-exilic period, <clears throat> you have a movement away from that idea of, of many gods and the Lord as the first of the 70 sons. And they, particularly from the time of the <clears throat> second Isaiah, so that's the disciples of the great Isaiah who were active during the period of the exile and slightly a little bit afterwards, uh, they fused the idea of the various divinities. And so we're left with really a constructed monotheism that as it moved forward, uh, its scribes tidied up all the remnants of the older faith. So any attempt to find how the Lord related to God Most High um, is beset with no end of problems. And you can't ever say, <clears throat> you know, the Bible says, and have it there with proof texts and neatly set out because the transmission of these ideas has been very, very complicated. Um, and that might sound a bit muddled, but on the other hand, the evidence is muddled as well. Does, um, does Yahweh being the son of El remind you of Ferd Enoch when it states that Metatron is the lesser Yahweh in the sense of reminder that there were originally two powers in heaven <clears throat> in early Judaism? Oh, yes. Um, and in fact, all the Enoch literature, which has survived in various forms and various collections, we've got the first Enoch, which survives mainly in Ethiopic, and then the second Enoch, which survives in Slavonic, and then the third Enoch, which is the Hebrew Enoch. And these all preserve memories of the time in the first temple when heaven was rather full of angels and other heavenly beings. And although we can't date any of the actual deposits of these texts, you can only go on the date of the um, oldest copy that we have of them. It's clear that they preserve very, very ancient traditions. And so when you have Metatron in the third Enoch, and comparable characters in the other Enoch literature, what you're having is what you're looking at is a really distant memory of the Hebrew temple centuries, centuries later. But because we have grown up with the idea that the Hebrew scriptures, as we have them, the Masoretic text, or Christian Old Testament, this was the norm, we've tended to look at all these other texts like the Enoch material as sectarian or deviant or a little bit odd, whereas in fact they were all um, the fruits of and the deposits from this much, much older um, heaven that was full of angels and so forth. But what is interesting in Metatron the lesser Yahweh and all these is that it reminds us that there was a hierarchy and that <clears throat> these heavenly beings all related to each other in a hierarchy. There were layers and layers and layers of them. And the point of contact 
between the human being and the heavenly world was the high priest, or in the time of the monarchy, it would have been the Davidic king in Jerusalem, who was also the high priest. And he was the human being who could become one of those heavenly beings. And so he became the Lord with his people. That's why one of his titles was Emmanuel. And then you get echoes of this when Metatron, who is a high priest figure, is called the little Yahweh and so on. And he is the conduit between the world of mortals and the world of the heavenly beings. So it's not that there were <clears throat> two powers in heaven in early Judaism. There were many, many powers in heaven long before early Judaism. And it's our way of perceiving uh, what a, what um, Second Temple Judaism was like that has caused the problem uh, because we have been <clears throat> brought up on you know the Bible alone if you're a Protestant Christian and all this other material becomes problematic only if you assume that they must have been of less importance or heretical simply because they're not like the Bible. And this is just uh, creating problems by our own assumptions. So Yahweh is the son of Ael <clears throat> and all the Enochic material, very, very important evidence for the religion of the Hebrews. Does Jesus keep calling Israel his people because it is connected to Yahweh receiving Israel as his inheritance in Deuteronomy chapter 32? Oh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> because Jesus was regarded as Yahweh incarnate. He's not the son of Yahweh. He is Yahweh incarnate. And so when Christians refer to or call Jesus the son of God, um, if you look at how <clears throat> Gabriel is described in, in Luke's gospel, I'm just turning up Luke's gospel now to get the words right. Um, when Gabriel uh, speaks to Mary, he says, um, Luke chapter one, he will be great. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he will be called the son of the Most High, the son of Elion. So Jesus is to be the incarnation of the first of the great angels. He's the incarnation of the guardian angel of Israel. And then Gabriel goes on, <clears throat> the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign, etc., etc., and this is because in the first temple, the Hebrew temple, Solomon's temple, the king was regarded as the incarnation of the Lord, the incarnation of the <clears throat> guardian angel of his people. And he was the son of God most high. This is a royal title. Get it in Psalm 89. He should call to me, you are my father and so forth. So if you start with the early Christian assertion, Jesus is Lord, which is something that evangelical Christians now use frequently. What they're actually saying is Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is Yahweh. And then you can begin to piece together the idea that some people find rather startling, that the Christian idea of the Trinity actually is a lot older than Christianity. Uh, the idea of a father and a son and a Holy Spirit is right there in the earliest Hebrew religion. And it got rather covered over <clears throat> in the way that uh, Hebrew religion developed by the time it came to be called the religion of the Jews in the Second Temple. And what the Christians were doing was reviving and restoring the older ways, Jesus is the incarnation of the Son of God Most High.
What do you make of the epistle of Jude when it's when it said that the Lord led a people out of Egypt? Is the author of Jude's letter alluding to this by by alluding that, that Jesus is Yahweh because it says here that the Lord led a people out of Egypt? Well, the early Christians regarded all the uh, references to the Lord in the in the Old Testament as pre-incarnation appearances of Jesus. There's, there's no question of that. I mean, there's an early commentary on um, the book of Daniel by Hippolytus, a um, writer in Rome, about 200. And he said that the, the great angel who appears in Daniel chapter 10 is our Lord, not yet fully incarnate. And then there's another church historian, um, I can't remember if it was Socrates or the Somanes, uh, who said that the church built a great temple, great church at Mamre, which isn't a Christian site at all, but they built a place at Mamre because that was where the Lord, who would be born of the Virgin, appeared to Abraham. So these appearances of the Lord in the Old Testament were regarded as um well pre-incarnation appearances of the lord and so the old testament texts about the lord could apply equally well to jesus this is how paul uses them those who call on the name of the lord will be saved that's romans chapter 10 um and it's the curious thing that has crept into christian reading way of reading the old testament that somehow the lord is god the father in the old testament and then you get the subsidiary question. So why are texts about God the Father applied to Jesus? And then lots of learned books are written about this. Whereas in fact, the premise there is wrong. Uh, the Lord is the second person. The Lord is the son in the Old Testament. Uh, the special God of Israel, the guardian angel of Israel. And Jesus was the Lord incarnate, Emmanuel, as Gabriel says in the christmas stories um god with his people and all the christians were doing was reviving the older ways do you think that philo's logos is the lord oh yes oh yes um philo <coughs> excuse me Philo's writing in Greek, and because he's writing in Greek, there's been a lot of rather misguided work on Philo, in my opinion, misguided anyway, assuming that he must have been using Greek philosophical categories when he was writing about the thought of his own people. Now, Philo is not the easiest of writers to follow. He goes round and round in circles and sometimes forgets where he was going. But it's quite clear from the imagery that Philo uses about the Logos that he knew the old traditions about the second God. And so he describes the Logos in terms of a high priest, all sorts of things like this. And those high priestly images have got nothing to do with Greek philosophy at all. What Philo has in common with Greek philosophy is the Greek language. Um, but that doesn't mean he's using the words in the same way. Um, <clears throat> Philo is a very, very important source for reconstructing the role of the Lord in First Temple thought and also evidence that this thought was still alive and flourishing <clears throat> in Egypt, northern Egypt, in the time of Christian origins, because Philo is, of course, an exact contemporary of Jesus of Nazareth. So you don't think that Philo is com is combining Hellenistic ideas of Judaism? You think that's a misinterpretation of Philo? I think that is now that's too broad a statement. You can't um, <clears throat> make a sweeping statement like that. But what you can say is that Philo's dominant ideas are those of an educated Jew of the time, uh, one who has not been overly subjected to the 
cleaning up process of Second Temple Jewish theology, one that was in touch with the older ways of his people. And he knew that the second God was the Logos. He chose to call the second God the Logos. Um, but the imagery he uses is absolutely clear. This is the imagery of the, the old royal high priest, the Melchizedek high priest. Um, and there are clues in Philo that link across to, for example, John's Gospel, which show that they are both thinking within the same um, general pattern, if you like. Um, a lot of the problems in biblical scholarship are caused by the scholar's assumptions, whereas if you clear your mind of all the assumptions and say, let's read what's actually there, uh, it is quite remarkable what is actually there. Who do you think that the unnamed angel in Joseph and Asenath is? Oh, my goodness, what a question. <clears throat> well, how long have you got? Joseph and Asenath is a very, very interesting text. Um, and before you start trying to allocate the different roles within it, you have to look at what this text might be. Uh, well, Joseph, we know who Joseph is, and Asenath is his wife according to the Genesis story. But as the story is told, Aseneth, who meets this unnamed angel, Aseneth stands for, or she's a figure who represents the old Hebrew mother goddess from the first temple. She was the mother of the sons of God. And this is one of the very interesting kind of paths to pursue when you're trying to identify what went on in the Hebrew heaven. And <clears throat> she was the lady originally, it's quite a long story to tell you about who Asenath is, because you need to do that before you can try to speculate who the great angel is that she meets. But Asenath was or appeared in the original scriptures as El Shaddai, of the god with breasts she is a deity a mother deity who suckles her children and the last time she appears in genesis certainly the way the story is told she is the one who speaks from the burning bush and she was known as the lady of the bush now the lady of the bush if you write that out in Hebrew, and Joseph and Asenath is the major texts, of course, in Greek, but many other languages as well. Um, and you put an H on the beginning. Ahasenath becomes is the Hebrew for the Lady of the Bush. So here in this novel, you have um, Mrs. Joseph. She later becomes Joseph's wife. But you here have a memory of the old mother goddess. And goodness knows what sort of propaganda this is, but the other things that were told about her uh, fit this perfectly. And she has, she lives in a tower. Well, we know she lived in a tower in the Jerusalem temple. The Holy of Holies was called a tower. And uh, she's up there and she's looking out towards the east in the Joseph and Athena story. And she sees an angel arriving in the sunrise and this angel isn't named but he clearly has a lot of power now the christians know about an angel in the sunrise um, and he appears the same angel appears again unnamed but he appears at the beginning of revelation chapter 7 i saw another angel ascend from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living god and he called out with a loud voice etc etc um, the unnamed angel is in fact the Lord appearing and what Asenath uh, has is a theophany. And then there's the curious business of the honeycomb and, and the bees flying up from it. But the unnamed angel in Joseph and Asenath, without 
any doubt once you put this back into a temple context. Uh, this is the angel of the dawn. This is the angel from the east, um, the angel who appears to mark the faithful in Israel. He appears in Ezekiel chapter 9, coming with six helpers, and there he's going to mark the faithful before the six helpers bring the judgment of the Lord upon the wicked city and so on. So the unnamed angel in Joseph and Asenath is the one who is called um, the angel of the dawn, or Jesus takes the name for himself and says, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. So all these characters have many names and titles, but once you get a basic picture of which titles go with which being, it becomes really quite a simple uh, process to assign them their different places in the religious heaven of the time. In the book, you've observed that um, virtually the entire New Testament is saying that Jesus is Lord. It mm -hmm. never refers to him as being the Lord's son. Mm -hmm. So would you say that because of that, would um, each New Testament author thought that Jesus was the Lord and is the Son of the Most High. Well, Paul makes it very clear, doesn't he? Uh, one God and one Lord Jesus Christ. He makes that very clear in his letter to one of his letters to Corinth. Um, the New Testament writers, I think I can say, were writing a very different giving a very different picture of Jesus from the one that is largely presented today. Um, Jesus is the incarnation of the, what Christians would call the second person of the Trinity. Uh, he's the incarnation of the Son of God. This is why in the Eastern churches, uh, the Christmas is called the Nativity according to the flesh. The events in Bethlehem were not when the second person of the trinity the son of god originated it's when the son of god came and took a human form uh, john's gospel sets this out very very clearly um, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory so john doesn't have a christmas story about shepherds and, and magi and things like that john gives us the theology that the the son is coming into the world and then at the end, the sun goes back again. And these simply, I mean, I have had experiences when I've been preaching of people who've been absolutely amazed to discover what the prologue to John's gospel really says. And yet they've been listening to it in carol services for all their lives and standing up because it's a very important thing. I don't know if you have that custom, but we still tend to stand up when the prologue to the fourth gospel is read but that's what it means and so you have i mean jesus is the lord the early christian acclamation um maranatha come lord they are summoning the lord to return all these things you have jesus presented by the gospel writers as the lord incarnate clever people who don't know the background to this wonder why the magi in matthew's gospel say where is he who is born king for we have come to worship him and then clever people who look at the end of matthew's gospel or other places and they say well human beings good jewish human beings would never have worshipped any other human being and the answer is that is true apart from the high priest whom they knelt before because he represented to them the presence of the Lord. So there are all sorts of, I mean, I've said this before, all sorts of problems in the New Testament that are created by scholars' false assumptions that they bring to the text. In the book, you talk about the ascension of Isaiah, mentioning two Yahwehs that the Father and the Son are both called Yahweh simultaneously. Yes. 
What do you think is going on there? Why do you think the offer is? Well, because, you see, you have this difficult Hebrew idiom, um, son of. And son of just means that you have been generated from. You are the same substance. We're starting to get into technical theological terms now. Um, not created, but begotten not created to use the words of the christmas carol and so the the hierarchy that kept the same divine substance or the same divine family was indicated by being a son and so in the book of revelation you have um my new name and the name of my father and they were one and the same um and we have to keep in mind this um, almost like the emanations that you get in the later Kabbalah, but that is an imprecise statement. There's a lovely um, illustration in one of the Gnostic texts. I think it's the Wisdom of Jesus Christ or possibly Eugnostus, where it compares the divine world to um, elements of time. Uh, 60 seconds make one minute, 60 minutes make one hour, 24 hours make one day. But they are all, the seconds, the minutes and the hours, they are all embedded within each other and make one day. And so too, all the angels and the, the divinities are all part of each other and part of the great hierarchy. And in the end, they form the great unity that we know as God. Now, again, that's um, an imprecise illustration. But what we are trying to do is to use human words to talk about something which the church fathers certainly recognized was beyond words. Uh, it was ineffable and therefore it could not really be spoken about. And this is the problem that we have all the time um, where careful study of the Bible involves careful study of all sorts of elements but somehow all too often missing the bigger picture and then that's not to say we shouldn't do careful study of the bible but we should always be aware of this much much bigger picture which means that bible study is too big a business for one lifetime but again that's all we've got so yahweh is the son of yahweh and so forth it's like in um Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, etc. You know, what's all this about? It's about things that are beyond words. What's your interpretation of Romans chapter 9, verse 5? Some think that Paul is claiming there that Jesus is God. Wait a minute. Which? Tell me again what you were. Romans chapter... Nine. Yes. Verse five. Romans chapter nine, verse five. Um, to them, that he's talking about the Jews here. To them belong the patriarchs, and of their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, God who is over all, be blessed forever. Amen. What's the problem there? Um, well, some he says that that what he's saying there is that the Messiah um, became incarnate as a Hebrew. Yeah, I just wanted to to know what your thoughts on that was, real quick, because some people. Well, I could. Do some you want a piece me. of Greek exegesis? That might be rather a complicated sure. thing to do. Now I can get a Greek. Do you want me to get a Greek text and have a look at it? Sure, if you want to. Yeah. Okay, all right. There we go. It's probably a punctuation problem in the image in the original. Um, Romans chapter nine, verse five. Um, Let's 
see if there's anything. I'm just looking to see if there's anything in the apparatus. Nothing significant in the footnotes to this. Um, I think it's just a, a general exclamation of, of um, you know, thanks to God or something like that. There is no um, <clears throat> massive text history of corruption on that one. So Paul is just saying loyally um, that the people of the Jews, one of them was the Messiah, which is kind of what you would expect. We have a super chat question from uh, someone in the audience. Christopher Malloy, thank you for you for your super chat. Please thank Miss Barker for her work and for this conversation. I believe she's a woman of faith, but she but can she please put temple theology into a first century historical context? Thanks. Right. Well, we can try that. <clears throat> um, the first Christians had um, a two way relationship with the temple. They believed that the temple of their own time had become terribly corrupt. And in this, they agreed with many of the Jews using that term in the technical sense of that time. And they, they just looked at the, the high priests and they said, woe to this house and woe to that house, because they were all corrupt and they were all busy um, feathering their own nest and collaborating with the Romans and, and uh, being a little too ecumenical with foreign religions and so forth. Um, and there were many people who wanted to restore the pure temple. And most of those people, I think, became uh, Christians. They became followers of Jesus because they recognized in him somebody around whom their aspirations, if you like, could cluster. Um, and so temple theology uh, was about restoring the world of the original temple. And it is set out in, and this would get a bit technical, so I'll avoid this, but it was, it, it was set out in very clever wordplay in the way they um, brought back older meanings from the Hebrew text and so forth. Um, and people of this persuasion regarded the second temple, the temple of Herod, second temple period, they regarded it as a total corruption, a total opposite of the beautiful original vision of the temple. And the original temple was, um, they symbolized her actually by the, the female figure that we've almost forgotten, the, the mother of the sons of God. And they called the second temple the harlot. And she was the exact opposite. And when the harlot burns in the book of Revelation, it's chapter 19, I think, and the, uh, the saints cry, Alleluia, and the smoke goes up to heaven. What they're doing is um, praising God that this terrible corrupt temple has gone and they can restore what they believed was the pure original temple and this was the christian ideal um first letter of peter the christians uh, chapter two i think it is the christians are described as the living stones and the spiritual house and so forth and eventually when christian churches were built when you know there was it was safe to give physical expression to a christian theology they built them in the same shape as the temple and the traditional church still has something that corresponds to the holy of holies and something that corresponds to the hechal the nave and so forth and it's only um, modern contemporary architecture that's done funny things with this uh, but traditional churches are uh, imitation temples if you like and Jesus of Nazareth, this is another of the word plays, they used to play on that name because um, the word that John says was written over the cross of Jesus was not Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus the Nazorios. There's an omega in the middle of that. 
And that means Jesus, the restorer or the guardian or the preserver, something like that. And that was um, wordplay in the Hebrew, obviously. And so Jesus was regarded as the king of the Jews and the restorer, restorer of the temple. So there are so many indications all the way through that the Christians wanted to restore the true temple and destroy the corrupted one that had grown up in recent centuries. I wanted to return to something you, were, you brought up earlier about Jesus being calling himself the son of the morning star. Why did he refer to himself as a son of the morning star? What was um, he, he calls himself, let me give you the quote. Um, if this is Revelation 22, 16, Jesus says, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. That's the actual words. Um, this is one of that collection of fragments of early Christian oracles that are just put together. The last column of the book of Revelation in the New Testament, it's from 22.6 along to the end. And Jesus describes himself using the old title, one of the old titles for the Davidic king. When, uh, if you go back to, unfortunately, the text is very damaged, but if you go back to Psalm 110, it's 109 if you're using a Greek Bible, uh, Psalm 110, verse 3, where the text is really, really damaged. But the last part of that verse seems to be saying, it's the description of the <clears throat> birth of the Messiah as the consecration of the royal high priest. So the two things go together. And it says, I have begotten you with dew, that's anointing oil, as the morning star. It was one of the titles that was given to the sacral uh, priest, the sacral king in ancient Jerusalem. The morning star was Venus and that very famous prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter, let me just turn that one up, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And that seems to have been based on the actual state of the heavens in Jerusalem in the autumn of, I think, 731 BC, when the planet Venus was passing through the constellation of the Virgin. I had a paleo astronomer explain this to me once and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing, but it was all there and he gave me a date and he said, oh yes, looking east from Jerusalem, this would have been, and he gave me a precise date which would have fitted perfectly well. So Jesus claiming to be or taking the title, the morning star, he is just taking one of the ancient royal titles. Would you connect that to the epistle to the Hebrews or the book of Hebrews, which claims that Jesus became the high priest? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, there's there's no question of that. Jesus is the, uh, Jesus, we have a great high priest. That's Hebrews 4.14. Um, yes, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, etc., etc. Oh, yes, the whole, um, the whole point of Hebrews is to say that to demonstrate that Jesus is the older priesthood restored, um, the priesthood in the time of the first temple, the great priesthood, was the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, that's a royal priesthood, Melchi, uh, Melech is the Hebrew for king. Um, and the Aaronites were, um, sec I say second class, that sounds awful, but they were not the great priesthood. And the whole point of Hebrews chapter 7 is to say that Jesus was the Melchizedek priesthood restored. And 
so he is more important if you like than the Aaronite priesthood and the Melchizedek priests believed in the mystical ascent to heaven and they had these mystical experiences and they were transformed and anointed it's all uh, quite a complicated thing to uh, to set out <clears throat> and the point of the um, letter to the Hebrews chapter 7 is that Melchizedek is raised up to eternal life whereas the Aaronite priesthood um, became priests because of the death of their predecessors and it's the contrast between Melchizedek being raised up to life and the Aaronite priesthood um, being passed on through death. Um, it's quite a complicated argument, but then the book of Hebrews is a complicated argument. We have another super chat question. Neophyte one, thank you for your super chat. I love your work, Dr. Barker. For Jews who believed in the second God, how did they understand his relation to the other divine powers, sons? Well, that's quite an easy one to answer. Uh, read Romans chapter 8 and read what is actually there and not what you have been preconditioned to find there. Um, Jesus is called the firstborn of many brethren. Uh, so he's the first of the family, so to speak. Uh, Christians, the name Christian doesn't mean a follower of Christ. It means someone who has been anointed. So we are all um, little anointed ones. And how did they understand Jesus' in relation to the other divine powers and the other sons? Well, the other sons are the Christians. And they regarded, if you look at Romans 8, Paul's argument there is that the original angels uh, made a bit of a mess of things. And this is the myth of the fallen angels and the corruption of creation. And the role of the new angels, which is the Christians, is to set creation free from bondage to decay, which is, of course, the basis for any Christian environment theology. Um, and then the old other divine beings, many of them passed into the angels of the early church. There's lots of angels around in the early church. Um, and there's a fairly seamless transition. But the key thing about the advent of Christianity is the Christians believed that they had become angels already. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, if you have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above and so forth. Um, and Christians call themselves the holy ones, the saints. So <clears throat> we are the angels. And when you look at yourself in a mirror and say, I'm looking at the face of an angel, that's good theology. There are some people out there that mischaracterize your work. Um, some people that I've, uh, that I've heard about on the, uh, on the internet and they say that, Oh, uh, Margaret Barker is claiming that Jesus is Yahweh because he didn't exist. I've literally heard that from some people. Um, but I, but you're but you say that G, that there was a there was a guy called Jesus that was crucified, and oh, that of course yes, people but, viewed yeah. him as incarnation of Yahweh. <clears throat> you can't stop people thinking silly thoughts. I mean, once you've published a book and it's out, you can't um, get it back again, or you can't say I'm only going to allow you to read it if you read it carefully and this sort of thing. Um, there are people who think curious things and they often get themselves a big following on the media and the social media because people are interested in curious things. Um, the original story is, is much more simple, actually. Um, a lot of the problems in understanding the New Testament have been created by the assumptions that scholars, particularly Protestant scholars, bring to them. Um, I mean, people who want to believe that Jesus didn't exist, well, that's fine, it, you know, doesn't affect me. Um, people might like to believe that Julius Caesar didn't exist, and again, that's fine, it doesn't affect me. Um, but what's the point of that? 
I can't see the point of making those sort of statements. Anyway. Let's get to the next super chat. Neophyte one, thank you for another super chat. You always seems like a complex deity with both masculine and feminine manifestations. Can you delve a bit into Yahweh's uh, dynamism? Now, this is <clears throat> a complex deity. That is an understatement. Um, masculine and feminine manifestations. Well, again, uh, this is complicated because you are dealing with manifestations of the eternal unity in the temporal plurality and we only have human words to deal with it so everything in the eternal state and in the temple that's represented as the holy of holies beyond the curtain everything in the eternal state is one great unity there is no division there is no time and so anything from that state uh, will have all of what is included in the masculine and feminine manifestations that we deal with in the material world. That said, we have the other problem that the mother of the Lord, as this is manifested in the... Or um, as it was, um, how can I put this, acted out, represented, I think might be a better word to use, in the, in the um, Jerusalem temple. The mother of the Lord um, was always the mother of the king. She represented the mother of the king. And so when the king died, the king's, one of the king's spouses became the next mother of the Lord. So you have this sort of Oedipal um, situation where the Lord has a mother and a wife, if you like, like everyone else is, does, but the mother is the one eternal figure. And you get this in the book of Revelation where the mother of the Lord in Revelation 12 is the woman clothed with the sun and her son gets put on the throne. And yet that same figure comes when the Lord comes from heaven with his great army and she comes as the bride of the lamb and it's the same figure. So you are dealing with... Um, a hugely complicated business of how to represent in a material world with time and space and change and decay and language to describe that how you then represent what is outside time beyond division and by definition beyond words so it is a it's a very difficult thing there comes a point when you have to just say well this is part of the mystery or this is the mystery who do you think was viewed as yahweh's mother um many point to asherah the, the wife of el in the canaanite religion um, yeah. how do you look at that well first of all a big spelling mistake uh, the Asherah who appears in the Hebrew Bible has been put there by the scribes who did the um, passing on and editing as they went. If you look at the inscriptions that survive, and there's only a few survive, um, her name was not Asherah, but Ashratah. And Ashratah means uh, either the one who uh, makes you happy or the one who points you onto the straight path. So she's a guide figure and a guardian figure. She is the mother of the Lord, <clears throat> uh, but she also has other titles. She is called the Queen of Heaven. She is called uh, the Holy Wisdom. She is, well, she's El Shaddai, got many, many names. Um, and what is interesting is that the two great names of the 
ancient Hebrew mother come through into Greek iconography, the, the wonderful pictures of Mary in the Orthodox Church. And they have <clears throat> two very important icon styles. One is one of Mary um, holding the baby and pointing to him. And that's called the icon of Mary who shows the way. That's clearly derived from Ashrata, meaning the lady who points you, keeps you on the straight path or makes you happy. And the other icon style is where Mary is sort of cuddling the baby cheek to cheek. And that is called the <clears throat> compassionate or merciful Mary. And one of the other great titles for the mother was actually uh, the womb. Um, and so Psalm 110 verse 3 uh, I have begotten you from the womb. It is actually I have begotten you from the great lady, the mother lady. So she is there in many, many forms, but in some places where it would have um, messed up the poetry and the meter and so forth, you find the scribes have been very, very clever in concealing her. But once you know their methods, um, you can actually undo them and you can find the lady in all sorts of amazing ways. Uh, very, very important figure indeed. I think recovering the mother of the original Hebrew temple is one of the great tasks that uh, confronts biblical scholars today. Uh, and that way we shall restore some real temple theology. How do you think uh, that they view the the devil, the early Christians? Do they think of the devil as being, in a sense, the brother of Jesus in some way? What do you think of that? Well, the <clears throat> traditional story is that he was created among the great angels. And when... Uh, they decided, or well, the Lord decided, to create the human being as his image, um, male and female. And because he was to be the image, or because this figure, the, the Adam figure, I must be careful about gender words here, the Adam figure was to be the image, the Lord commanded all the angels to worship him. And one angel refused to worship and said, I will not worship him because I uh, was created first and so he should worship me. And Michael the archangel went to him and said, you know, one more chance, otherwise you're out. And he still refused to worship the image of the Lord. And so uh, the devil and his angels were thrown from heaven. This is the vision in Revelation chapter 12, but you find it in uh, other old stories. You find it in the Quran as well. And the devil vowed revenge. And so the first thing he did <clears throat> was put uh, a tree in Eden, which looked exactly like the permitted tree. And then um, he persuaded uh, the human couple. And the rest of that story is history. But you also find it in the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness when uh, the devil comes to Jesus as the image of God and says to him, I will give you all the cities in the world if you will worship me. And that's the devil bringing back the old controversy. So we know the early Christians knew this story, even though this story isn't actually in the Bible. Um, and this is how uh, Satan is regarded. Satan in the um, New Testament certainly is depicted as the the dreadful red dragon and so forth. Um, and he symbolizes all sorts of people. But fundamentally, uh, the red dragon is the one who opposes the great lady of the temple and her son, the Messiah. But again, that would take a very, very long time to unpack for you if you did it in detail. Let's take a look at the next super chat. Neophyte one. Thank you for another super chat. I could pick your brain all day, but this will be my last question. In Job, Satan is portrayed as a son of God. How does he relate to the second God? 
oh, that's a lovely one. Yes, well, Job, the book of Job is full of problems. <clears throat> but in the prose framework of the book of Job, um, all the great angels are up in heaven and they're having a chat and, and generally being angels up in heaven. And Satan comes to Yahweh and says, um, your servant Job is only loyal to you because of what he can get out of it. Uh, you go and tempt him and see if he will still remain faithful. And this is a very interesting glimpse of the world of the Hebrew temple when Satan is there and he is amongst the angels still, but he's as a, a tempter and he is challenging Yahweh to test his servants. Um, so Satan is uh, and remains uh, an angel, the son of God, but he's a fallen son of God. And that's very important. And in the book of Job, he taunts Yahweh and says, your servants are only loyal to you because it's in their interests to do that. So that's how he relates to him. What do you think caused the the first Christians, the earliest Christians, to decide to stick with the older uh, Israelite practices that there were two heavenly powers instead of uh, sticking to the later edited uh, re uh, reformed practice of only one God? I suspect because the older ways have never gone away um, <clears throat> and that, you see, uh, it was the old question of the power of the publishing houses. Until recently, we only had the writings of, or any study seriously, the writings of the <clears throat> Second Temple Jews, correctly so called. Uh, but now we are realizing that so many other texts are witnesses to a huge variety of heirs of Hebrew tradition and culture. And the Jesus of Nazareth actually was the catalyst who brought them all together. And this is why there's so many varieties in early Christianity, you know, those seven sects of this and that so forth that you get listed, because <clears throat> they existed in their many different forms already and Christianity became a kind of unifying factor for them but they kept with them a lot of the um, older differences, customs, what have you that they brought from their pre-Jesus era. You see this illustrated very interestingly in the book of Revelation where uh, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7 where you have the angel of the dawn who comes with his seal and he's going to uh, mark the servants of God on their foreheads. And first of all, he marks 12,000 from each of the old tribes. So this is a Hebrew vision. And then there's a kind of supplement that says, and then he, he um, there's a, a crowd of people from every people and nation and tongue and so forth. And that's the new influx of Gentiles that came into the movement um, with the missionary work of the first Christians. But they really found a way of coming together and finding a voice and a unity and a presence because of um, the ministry of Jesus. It's from Aloy, thank you for your super chat. Was the trial of Jesus Christ and Jesus Barabbas a literal or metaphorical retelling of the Passover sacrifice ritual? That's a very interesting question. Um, it's not the Passover sacrifice though. It's the Day of Atonement sacrifice. This is one of the biggest problems in Christian uh, um, exegesis, understanding Holy Week in the context of the temple. 
uh, you find this, you know, you know the story of the Day of Atonement, you have to have two identical goats and one is killed and one is driven off and so forth. Um, and you find this in the earliest Christian commentators, you find it in the book of Hebrews, uh, you find it in the letter of Barnabas, which used to be in the New Testament and then got dropped. Um, the date of the crucifixion was Passover, but we're not sure whether it was the day of Passover or uh, whether it was the day after Passover, you know, was the Last Supper of Passover meal, all this kind of thing. Um, but the earliest Christian theology, the dominant strain, sees the crucifixion as the day of atonement sacrifice. You see, Passover at that time had nothing to do with atonement. And the great high priestly ritual that involved symbolically the high priest sacrifice of himself, but for practical reasons, you offered a goat instead. Um, this was fulfilled. You see this in Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9 talks about um, the, the great redemption, the great atonement sacrifice, not being made with substitutes of bulls, or uh, calves and goats, but with Jesus himself. So that's another area that needs a lot of unpacking if you do your temple theology properly. Um, Jesus and Barabbas is one of the many motifs of not the Passover sacrifice, but the Day of Atonement sacrifice. And when you start looking at it in that context, uh, a lot of the questions disappear. Others arise, but yeah, it's a very exciting thing to do. In page uh, 100 to 101 in, in, in your book, you talk about um, um, the, the fusion between El and Yahweh by the editors of the Old Testament. But in the next page, you get into uh, uh, Simon Bar Kokhba. Now, Bar Kokhba is a, a mean, mean son of the star. Yeah. Um, what do you think is happening there? Why are they calling this Simon guy in the second century CE? Major well, he's, not, he's another messianic figure. He wants to rebuild the temple. Uh, he's, a, if you like, a Jesus character. This was a much broader movement than just the Christians. Um, if you look at the Bar Kokhba coin that was minted in, or oh, one, I can't remember the date, 135 perhaps. Um, and if you look on it, it shows you four pillars of a temple building and then an arc between the two central pillars. Now, four pillars on a building represents the Holy of Holies. Five pillars represents the temple. So this isn't just the rebuilding of the temple. This is looking again into the Holy of Holies, and the Ark is restored. And that is exactly the vision you have at the end of Revelation chapter 11. God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark was seen. The Ark disappeared. It wasn't in the second temple. Um, this restoration of the Ark was going to be the sign of the true temple returning. It's the central vision in the book of Revelation and it's also the image that was chosen for the Bar Kokhba coin. So they were all hoping for the same thing. And it's only the way history has been written that has obscured what was really going on. We got another super chat. Neophyte One looks like he's back for another question. Many early Gnostic Christians believed the God of Moses was different from the father of Jesus. Could this have been an esoteric teaching of Jesus? Ah, now this gets us into very complicated territory indeed. Um, <clears throat> the Gnostics, by and large, and here I've got to be broad brush, and there will be many people who could say, ah, oh, but, and that's quite true. The Gnostics, by and large, were perpetuating, sometimes in garbled form, <clears throat> the uh, heavenly world of the first temple. So 
all those hierarchies of angels and things like that, um, if you know the first temple quite well, you recognize them, albeit in a slightly garbled form. And the great enemy of the uh, first temple people was the hierarchy that developed in the second temple at the time when the emphasis on Moses was increasing. During the time of the monarchy, Moses was there, but he wasn't a big, important figure. After the decline of the monarchy, um, second temple period, Moses becomes more and more and more important because they don't have kings. Although Philo actually compared Moses to a king, which is quite interesting, shows how far the um, fusion had gone. Now, <clears throat> because the first temple uh, was the one where the Gnostics had their roots, everything that was in the second temple, namely the God that was, you know, the one God that's associated with the rising power of Moses, becomes for them um, a bad thing. And he is known as the God of the blind or the blind God. And this is because in the first book of Enoch, there is a fragment. This is the best example I can give you. There's a fragment of a history of Jerusalem. It's called the Apocalypse of Weeks. And it says that when the people began to turn away from the first temple religion, the priests became blind. They lost their spiritual sight, literally is what they says. And so all the people who followed the new, improved, um, really Moses alone version of Hebrew faith that developed, they became called the people who had lost their spiritual sight. And the one God of the second temple becomes known as the God of the blind. And that's what lies behind a lot of the um, hostility in the Gnostic texts. Why do you think that the Gnostics um, viewed the Jewish God as evil? Because he represented everything in the second temple that they regarded as evil. Um, and so just as they wanted the harlot temple to be burned, so they wanted the restoration of the original um, deities, I have to use the plural, of the original temple of Solomon. But you can unpack this. I mean, it takes a lot of doing in the Gnostic text. And a lot of the Gnostic texts we only have in Coptic and very garbled. And some have come through Greek. Some seem to have come directly from a Semitic language, I think Hebrew. And a lot of the technical terms in the Gnostic texts are clearly someone who didn't understand the Hebrew he or she was hearing. And so we've got lots of very interesting spelling mistakes. But once you know, uh, again, the hazards that you're looking for, you can, uh, particularly in the early Gnostic texts, you can reconstruct quite a lot of the first temple from them. Um, but it was hostility to the second temple, which meant hostility to the way God was viewed in the second temple. I also thought that Satan was the Jewish God. Why do you think they were thinking that? Why do you think they took it that far, that the outright thing that he's... I don't world? know. I don't know the answer to that at all. Um, uh, there was certainly huge hostility. But the problem is, whenever you're dealing with these things, um, for example, the Gnostics that I've just mentioned very briefly, um, until 1947, was it 47 or 45, when the Nag Hammadi find was made, um, we had to rely mainly, there were other texts, but mainly 
we only knew about the Gnostics from people who didn't like them, like Epiphanius of Salamis, like um, Irenaeus. I mean, he, he wrote you know, his great life's work was rubbishing the Gnostics. And you don't expect to get a fair and reasoned account of a religious group from people who absolutely hate them. And so we, we've got embedded in our perception of the Gnostics um, how their enemies described them. And that really wrong foots you from the start. Um, so getting back to what they actually thought is another task for biblical scholars. I mean, you know, there's plenty of work to do. Last question. Um, in page 105, you talk about the Philo and the Targum, the Targums. Oh, yes. Show that the word, uh, that the word was a much a designation of Yahweh as a, as a name. Um, yeah. could, you, could you discuss with the audience what, what's going on there? Well, the name of the Lord was deemed to be too sacred to pronounce and indeed still is and so when you are reading a hebrew text and you come across the name the four letters of the name <clears throat> you automatically read another word you either read adonai which means lord or you read hashem which means the name and there may be other things as well uh, and the name comes to be, if you like, a reverent way of avoiding using the actual sacred name. And as a result of this, we're not quite sure how it was pronounced and where you can rely on, we have to rely on, you know, Greeks who said, well, it sounded like this, but then Greek doesn't sound like Hebrew. It's got different noises completely, different shaped mouth when you're speaking it. So, just to use the name as you know capital n avoids the problem really we have a super chat question paul kickling thank you for your super chat if christ and antichrist are the same unity or maybe read, uh, let me reread that are from the same unity from the monad being crucified to create dualism why is it so hard for people to understand brothers also basically means they are the same person You know, I would need to think about that question a lot. Um, it's a very interesting question. But honestly, I don't think I would want to start answering it without giving it a lot of thought. So I'm sorry about that. But it is a very interesting question. Well, thanks for joining me today, Dr. Margaret Barger. And I thank everybody else that's super tired of their questions. I appreciate their continued support for my channel. And I appreciate everybody else uh, that participated in the live chat discourse. And I'll see everybody later. Thanks again, Doctor. It's nice to be here. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.